Hi, in this video lecture, I will present and explain the ontological argument for the existence of God, which is, in, in uh, many people's view, one of the most controversial argument for the existence of God. I guess the controversy uh, is due to the fact that the argument itself is very simple, and it tries to derive the existence of God from the definition of God, as you will see. I am not here to uh, defend the argument or uh, refute the argument, but just to explain it as a way of a lecture. And um, the last thing that I wanted to say before I explain the argument is that um, there have been many versions of the argument since its uh, inception. And I will try to cover at least the, uh, the most important versions. So, why is the ontological argument called ontological, first of all? The word uh, ontological is a compound word, onto and logia. Essentially, it's the, uh, the study of being, ontology. So, uh, the study of the existence of God, in this sense, the ontological argument. Saint Anselm was the first philosopher in the West, at least, who proposed uh, the ontological argument. He uh, wrote about the argument in, uh, in his famous Prosologion book in 1078. So let's look at the argument. When uh, Anselm ha uh, discusses the existence of God, he um, regards God as a being that is the, the most perfect and the greatest possible being. To quote Anselm, God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. So when you think about God, according to Anselm, you cannot even, not even conceive, not even think about anything that is greater than God. This word seems strange. What, what does that mean, great? Well, great in, in a sense of excellent. God is the most excellent being that one can possibly imagine. Now, it doesn't matter that I can imagine or he can imagine. That's, that's strange, too. But the, the point I think that Anselm wants to make is that there is nothing greater. It doesn't matter whether Joe or Sally or I can imagine or think. The point is, if we define God, how would we define God? Obviously, according to Anselm, as, the, as a being that is the greatest. So God is the greatest possible, imaginable, conceivable being. Now, to be more, uh, more specific, to uh, earn that title of the greatest possible being, God has certain characteristics. For example, he is omnipotent. He's not just powerful. He's not just potent. He's omnipotent. He's got all the power, uh, maximal power. There is nothing more powerful than God. How much power? Well, a lot of power. A lot more than anything that could possibly exist. 
not more than anything that does exist, but that, that could possibly exist. So imagine this as a, as a science fiction movie where you can create your own world, okay? What kind of world could you create? You could create a world, for example, where uh, uh, potatoes fly, where squirrels uh, teach quantum mechanics. It doesn't matter. But the bottom line is that you could not possibly create a world in which there is a, a being who is more powerful than God. And the same thing applies to uh, knowledge. So God is omniscient, is the uh, infinitely knowing. Also, God must be uh, morally perfect, omnibenevolent, and omnipresent. He also must be eternal, because that's an important aspect of perfection and excellence. A God that is not eternal is not perfect. God who is perfect is, is a God who uh, was not created by anyone or anything. It ha he has been there forever, for, from eternity. So in a, in a word that we can capture that by saying that God is a necessary being. Or uh, in other words, God is a being that lacks nothing. Now, when I talk about necessary beings, I mean, as I said, uh, a being, God is a being who is necessary. His existence is necessary. He cannot not exist, and he cannot uh, take himself, himself out of existence. Now, there are, of course, impossible beings Okay, um, what could it, what could be the, the an example of an impossible being? A round square is an impossible thing. Uh, a um, a married bachelor is an impossible being. A um, a god who. Uh, was brought into existence by something else is an impossible being. You get the idea. There are also contingent beings. Okay, Contingent beings are things that uh, can and cannot exist. It doesn't matter. Uh, they may exist. For example, rocks may exist. You can't imagine a world without rocks, for example. Uh, or a unicorns. They don't exist, but they are logically possible. It could be conceived logically that a world contains unicorns. So their existence is logically possible, okay? And their non-existence is also logically possible. Unicorns don't have to exist. They may and they may not exist. Now, let's, with, with uh, these preliminaries taken care of, let's look at Anselm's ontological argument. Now, in, uh, in the Proslogion, Anselm offers two, very, two, um, two arguments. They're very similar. They are related. They, they seem... Uh, to be the, the same argument, but they're not. If you uh, read carefully, there are two different arguments. They, they argue two different things. So let me explain one by one. So first of all, before I, I lay out the argument with the premises and the conclusion, let's look at the structure of the argument. Anselm starts with a supposition that even an atheist has the concept of God, namely the concept of, of the greatest 
possible being. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. If you're an atheist, you're thinking, oh, that's nonsense, spurious. I am an atheist, and I don't have the concept of God. So, what Anselm is trying to, to, to show here is not that the atheist believes in God, and it's got an idea of God. The point is, even if you are an atheist, you can, if you're honest, you uh, just cannot deny that the existence of a greatest possible being is not absurd. Now, of course, of course, some atheists do argue just that. They say, no, I'm sorry. That's exactly what I think about God, that God is an absurdity. There's no such being as the greatest possible being. There's not such a thing. But Anselm, as I said, again, relies on this notion that if you're honest, come on, be honest and think about it. Isn't it possible that there exists a being who is excellent, that lacks nothing, the greatest possible being. And, uh, and some, we're, we're, I think, will respond to the atheist, the stubborn atheist who says, no, 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 there is no such being. He would say, well then, if you think that there is no such being, could you demonstrate that such a being cannot possibly exist? And it's kind of hard to do. It's kind of hard to, to, to uh, offer an argument that shows what well, God doesn't exist. We're going to uh, look at one such argument at the end of this presentation. And in my next lecture, uh, I'm going to consider other arguments. For example, the argument that says that God cannot be... Uh, infinitely powerful because God cannot possibly create a stone so heavy he cannot lift that kind of that kind of argument we are going to look at that in the, in the next video lecture so uh, let's uh, let's proceed and take it for granted that okay fine it is possible I don't believe that, that there is such a being, but it is possible, at least logically possible, that God exists. All right, so now Anselm says, okay, fine. Now, if you admit that it, it is at least possible, at least conceivable, it doesn't really violate any laws of logic that there is the greatest possible being, then you must admit that such a being exists in the intellect, in your mind. Okay? Now, something that exists in reality is greater than something that exists only in thought, only in your mind. Think about, for example, uh, a lottery win. Which is greater? The one that is real, not the one that is in your mind. So the uh, the conclusion from these premises is that if God is the greatest of all possible beings, then God must exist in reality. Because to be the greatest being possible... Uh, God must have existence in reality, not only in the mind of a person. Now, let's look at the argument a little uh, closer. So, the first premise would be the greatest possible being cannot exist 
only as an idea in the mind because in addition to existing as an idea in the mind, it can also be thought of as existing, existing in reality, in the real world. And that is greater than existing only as an idea. So the reality is greater than just an idea. And if the greatest possible being exists only as an idea in the mind, then there is a being that is greater than God, namely one that exists in the mind and in reality. But this is impossible, it's absurd. It's just self-contradiction because by definition, as we define God, God is the greatest of all possible being, beings. Consequently, there is no being that is greater than the greatest. There is no being who is greatestest. The greatest is superlative. There's, it's the top. There's nothing greater than the greatest by definition. Therefore, the greatest possible being, God, must exist. Not only in your mind, but also in reality. All right. So let's look first uh, at what this means again in, uh, in simpler, simpler words. A God that exists in the mind and in reality is greater than a God that exists only in the mind. Okay. It, seems, uh, it seems right. And if God exists only in the mind, then God is not God because God is the greatest possible being, one that exists both in reality and in the mind. Therefore, the claim that God does not exist in reality would imply a contradiction. And therefore, it would be necessarily false. A contradiction is necessarily false. Now, if the claim that God does not exist in reality is uh, self-contradictory, is necessarily false, then the opposite claim must be true. And consequently, God exists. Before uh, we comment on that argument, let me now explain the second argument in the Prislogion. The second argument is slightly different because you could, you could think, for example, maybe the first argument proves that God exists in reality. But Anselm wants to make sure to, uh, to specify that God is not like me or you. In other words, God is not a contingent being, but he's a necessary one. He exists by definition. He cannot not exist. So his second argument says, it is possible to think of a necessary being, okay? a being that, whose existence is the, uh, the essence of that being. A necessary being would be greater than a contingent being. So, if the greatest possible being could be thought of as not existing, it would be a contingent being. If you can think God can exist or not, but then the greatest possible being would not be the greatest possible being, which is just a, an outright contradiction and absurd. So the greatest possible being has necessary existence. Its non-existence is impossible. In other words, it is possible to think of a necessary being. Okay? A being whose non-existence is impossible. That's what God is, according to Anselm. God is a being that exists by definition. 
Uh, you can't even imagine uh, God that doesn't exist and then five minutes later it comes into existence. Necessary existence is greater than contingent existence. And a, a necessary being is greater than a contingent being. So if the non-existence of God is possible, then you, uh, you produce a, uh, an absurdity because God must be a contingent being. But, but then God would not be God because a contingent being cannot be the greatest possible being, which is God. Therefore, the claim that God's non-existence is even possible implies a contradiction and it is necessarily false. And if the claim that God's non-existence is possible is necessarily false, then the opposite must be true, which is that the greatest possible being, God, exists. All right, so it's important to understand that God is the only being whose non-existence is logically impossible. Even, uh, let's say, numbers, even numbers, or you, anything that you can think of is not logically necessary. Only God is logically necessary. There's nothing before God. There's nothing that, that goes above or beyond God. God is necessity. So no other being deserves the title of the greatest possible being. Now, the existence of all other beings, as I said, even numbers, uh, ideas, thoughts, angels, whatever, what have you, are contingent. Okay? Either contingent or impossible. For example, Unicorns are contingent, rocks are contingent, babies, people, we are contingent. Contingent means that we, uh, we don't exist by definition. We exist because our parents brought us into existence or something created that thing. Or something can be impossible, possible like the example of a married bachelor that I gave before. Now, how can anyone doubt or deny the existence of God? Anselm, quoting the Bible, says that the fool, like the atheist or agnostic, does not understand the true meaning of the greatest possible being. Only a fool could doubt that. Because the fool doesn't understand the meaning of this. If you understand, so in, a, in, in essence, the argument is that if you understand the meaning of God, okay, then you will realize that God must exist. Now, one question for you to think about, to chew on, will be uh, who decides the definition of God? Who defined God? like that. I can see Anselm answering that question by saying, how else would you uh, define God if not the most excellent being that could possibly exist? If you say, well, no, my definition of God is a being, a modest being, not the, the most excellent, great, uh, nonetheless, but not the greatest, not the most excellent. What Anselm would say, Okay, fine, but that, that is not what God means. If there is a God, he must be the absolute greatest possible. Another uh, philosopher, René Descartes, a very famous philosopher, later 
couple of centuries later, rehashed the argument. Descartes was interested in uh, improving that knowledge is possible. And if you uh, if you read enough philosophy, you uh, you know Descartes uh, by the uh, the very famous uh, dictum. I think, therefore I am. I think if even rocks know that. I think, therefore I am. So according to uh, to Descartes, we know something by definition. We know something, and we we have innate knowledge, because I think, therefore I am, is a truth that is completely um, logical. It requires no uh, observation whatsoever. I think the very fact that I'm thinking right now, I don't know if I'm a person with a mouth, with hair, with hands. I don't know if I exist in my office right now, if I'm talking to a computer. But I can tell you this, there is no way that you can convince me that I don't exist, because if I am thinking, I do exist. So Descartes found himself painted into a corner because the only truth that he could prove was that, that he thinks, therefore, he exists. Well, what about the other people? What about the world? What about my office? What about the fire? What about the trees? So in order to, uh, uh, to restore the world and uh, guarantee that the world does exist, Descartes used uh, Anselm's argument to show that God exists. And if God exists, by definition, God is all good, omnibenevolent. And an omnibenevolent being would not just deceive me, make me think like in the Matrix, that I'm in the Matrix, but I, uh, but I think that I live in the world where, where other people exist. Okay? Uh, because God is good. So he uses essentially the same argument. Uh, he presents it in, uh, from a different angle. One of the things that, that Descartes points out to defend the argument is that um, existence is an essential uh, quality of God that you can't take away. Let me give you an example. If I tell you that I have a green triangle, now, the color green, obviously, is not a, uh, an essential part of what a triangle is. In other words, I can separate the green from a triangle because the triangle is not a thing that is defined as being green. Now think about a triangle whose angles equal two right angles, 180 degrees. Well, you see, I cannot separate the concept of 180 degrees from what it is to be a triangle. Because that is an essential element of what it is to be a triangle. If I separate that idea, I don't have a triangle anymore. And Descartes wants to, wants to show that God exists. If I, when I say God exists or God is, I am making the same statement as a triangle is a geometrical figure whose sum of internal angles is 180 degrees. In other words, when I say God exists, I mean that God <clears throat> and existence are not separable. Existence is essential to God. If you take away existence from God, 
you no longer have God. If you uh, take away 180 degrees from triangles, you no longer have triangles. Now, let's think about what's wrong with the ontological argument. <clears throat> and again, I'm not here to uh, refute the ontological argument. I, I just want to uh, suggest <clears throat> some of the, uh, the main counter-argument. Now, Anselm, St. Anselm, as well as René Descartes, assumes that existence, the existence of the greatest possible being, is logically possible. Okay, so that's one of the elements that we have to uh, focus on. It is possible, as we uh, discussed earlier. So let's look at some criticisms of Anselm's argument, and also Descartes' argument. Now, in the first premise of his first argument, Anselm says that the greatest possible being cannot exist only as an idea, but to be the greatest, this being, God, must exist also in reality. Not only in the mind, but outside the mind. And uh, in the third premise of the second argument, Anselm says that if the greatest possible being could be thought of as not existing, it would be a contingent being. But then the greatest possible being would not be the greatest possible being. And that is absurd. Now, one contemporary of Anselm, a, uh, a monk with the name of Gaunilo, tried to uh, reject, to refute Anselm's argument. <clears throat> Now, he was a monk. He didn't have the desire to, uh, uh, to uh, reject or to, de to deny or question the existence of God. Gaunilo thought that God exists, but it can be proven by using the ontological argument. Which, by the way, at that time, I, I just want to mention this, the argument was not referred to as ontological argument. It was Immanuel Kant, philosopher Immanuel Kant, who invented that term. And we're going to talk about him in a, in a second. Now, let's look at Gaunilo's response to uh, Anselm's argument, because it's very interesting. Gaunilo's response, essentially, is that Anselm's argument is absurd. The whole argument is absurd. Why? Because, well, you can uh, substitute the word God. Every time you see God or the greatest possible being, you can substitute that with, well, anything you want. The greatest possible pizza, the greatest possible island, the greatest possible pair of shoes, and uh, it should work as well, okay? But it leads to an absurdity. So let's look at the argument in detail. Gaunilo says, the greatest possible island, okay, think about the greatest possible island. The greatest possible island cannot exist only in thought as an idea. It, it must also exist in reality. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the greatest possible island. Because the greatest possible island 
is not only one that exists as a thought, but it must exist in reality. Now, if the greatest possible island exists only as an idea in the mind, then there is an island that is greater than the greatest possible island, one that exists in the mind and in reality. But this is absurd. This is just a plainly absurd because it's like saying there is a, a greater island than the greatest island. But greatest is the top, is the superlative. There is no greatest er. Consequently, the greatest possible island must exist not only as an idea in the mind, but in reality. But the problem, Gonilo uh, points out, is that there is no such thing as the greatest possible island. So, this argument that I just presented, Gonilo says, is, is just fallacious. It's bad. But then think about it. The argument that I just presented is identical to Anselm's argument. All I did was, instead of the greatest possible being, I substituted with the greatest possible island. So, by logical symmetry, okay, if Anselm's argument is fallacious, I mean, if my argument is fallacious, Anselm's argument must also be fallacious, must be bad too. Now, is this argument really a good argument? Mm, not too many people think so. Think about it. First of all, Anselm could just answer that islands are, by definition, contingent beings, contingent things. They don't exist. It's just absurd to say that an island exists necessarily. So, it can be the same. You cannot substitute anything that you want for God because God is, by definition, a necessary being. His essence is existence, part of his ex essence. God cannot not exist. But an island clearly doesn't have to exist. Second point, an island can never possess maximal properties. What would, what would that mean for an island to be the greatest possible island? You can always add more. If a greatest island, for example, is an island uh, um, 300 uh, uh, square feet, you can make an island that is bigger than that. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. All the way, and, and the universe is the limit. An island that has more tasty fruit, you can make more tasty fruit, sweeter fruit, softer and softer sand, more trees, more uh, um, of anything. So you will never get to the, uh, the greatest possible island. On the other hand, God is fundamentally different because God is infinitely powerful, infinitely knowing, and so on, infinitely good. So it works with God, but it doesn't work with the island. Sorry, Ganulo, Gaunilo. It doesn't work, your argument. Now, Let's go back to the uh, this claim. Think about it a little more carefully. Existence is a property or quality of God's nature. I have said this a number of times, but why don't we test it now? Is it true that existence is a property or quality of God's nature? So, by analyzing the word God, it will be obvious, according to Anselm, that the word God includes existence. 
And so God exists. Now compare these two. A triangle equals means three-sided figures whose sum of internal angles equal equals 180 degrees. God equals exists. Let's look at Immanuel Kant's objection to, uh, to this. First of all, existence is not a real property. Kant observes that existence is not a concept of something that could be added to the concept of a thing. So in other words, if I think about a pillow, when I think about a pillow, I think of it as an existing thing. I already include existence. Because if the thing doesn't exist, it, doesn't, it just doesn't exist. So God exists is not saying something like a triangle's internal angles equal 180 degrees. When I say God exists, according to Kant, okay, we attach no new predicate or quality okay, description to the concept, concept of God. The only thing that we do is that we, po we posit, posit the subject in itself with uh, all its predicates as being an object that stands in relation to my concept. Okay, so existence doesn't really uh, improve uh, or describe God uh, as, as an attribute. It's not an attribute that you can add, and if it doesn't have existence, is not as good as it would be if you added that um, characteristic. For example, uh, a coffee that is bitter is not as good as a coffee that is uh, that is sweet when uh, you add some sugar in it. Okay, it's not the same. So uh, you can't say, according to Kant, that. God that exists uh, is an addition. That existence is an addition like the sugar in the coffee. It doesn't work that way. That God exists is the very thing, essentially, that Anselm needs to prove. Okay? So, in other words, Kant would say, first, show me that God exists. And then the argument that a God that exists is better than a, a God that only exists in, in the mind, that would be a good argument. But first you have to prove it. And you can't prove it by the very thing that you need to prove. The second point that Kant makes is that God does not exist is not self-contradictory. You see, according to uh, Descartes and Anselm, the uh, non-existence of God is a contradiction because, hey, God exists by definition. Now, any statement about an object can be self-contradictory, okay? But Kant says, I don't have to commit myself to the existence of God unless you show me that God exists. So, if the object is just held not to exist in the first place, then it has no essence to be co contradicted. Remember the example of a triangle. A triangle has, by definition, three sides. And Kant says, but I can't deny the existence of triangles, and so there's nothing there to be contradicted. That's, that's the end of the story. So when, when it comes to God, I don't have to say that 
that God exists. I don't have to, there's no uh, logical commitment. Uh, there's no God police that forces me to, uh, to hold uh, that God exists. That's the, uh, after all, that is the very uh, uh, question that we are trying to establish, whether God exists. So uh, if you start with the, uh, the idea that God exists, then of course the argument works. And, uh, and the non-existence of God would be absurd. But if you uh, don't start with that presupposition, then there's no contradiction. Now, let's look at another version of the ontological argument. Uh, another version that, yes, I think that it escapes Kant's criticisms and most of the other criticisms. But let's see at what cost. Now, these two uh, versions were uh, presented by contemporary philosophers, Plantinga and Malcolm. Norman, Norman Malcolm, contemporary philosopher, thought that it's a very, it's a very neat argument that Plantinga improved. Malcolm's argument is the following. God's existence is either possible or impossible. Either there is a God or there isn't a God. However, the existence of God is not impossible. As I said, this, uh, this is something, this is a contention that we will explore later in, an, in a different video lecture. But Let's take it for granted that it's not impossible, as I discussed earlier. After all, how could you possibly demonstrate that the existence of God is impossible? Why not? For all we know, the universe is strange. Why can't we say that there is a God? So, if God is not impossible, then by logical necessity then God's existence is possible. But if it is possible, then you have two options. Either God is a contingent being, or God is a necessary being. But God is not a contingent being, because to be God, it means to be eternal. It means to be uh, excellent. And so uh, God must be necessary. And therefore, if God is necessary, God must exist necessarily. I'm not sure if this is a convincing argument for, the, for similar reasons, uh, but let's look at Plantinga's argument first. The famous... Uh, ontological argument uh, presented in a, in a modal version. So Plantinga's argument relies upon the, uh, um, what is known as modal logic. Modal logic, I'm not going to give you a lecture in modal logic here because it, it would be too long, but modal logic is a logic that studies possibility what is possible and what is necessary. And given that something is possible and something is uh, necessary, then it, it would follow, depending on, on the modal uh, logical system that you're dealing with, it would follow that if something is even necessary, then it must exist by definition. Let's look at the argument. The first premise says, the concept of a maximally great being 
is self-consistent. Okay? As I said before, it is not impossible that there is an omniscient, omnipotent, and morally perfect being. Now, if this is true, the first premise is true, then there is at least one logically possible world okay, in which a maximally great being exists. As I said earlier, think about it a possible world. Think about it like in a science fiction movie that you are creating a world. What kind of world can you create? Can you create a world where uh, triangles have fewer or more than three sides? No, that's not a possible world that you can create. But can you create a world uh, where there is an omniscient, omnipotent, and morally perfect being? Yes, of course, because these are compossible, compossible attributes. In other words, they fit together well like a puzzle. Okay? All together is possible. And that's what a, a greatest, a maximally great being is. A being is maximally great only if it possesses these characteristics, these compossible attributes in, uh, in some possible world. Actually, to be, uh, to be a maximally great, this being cannot possess these characteristics only in a possible world that you can create. To be maximally great, this being must possess these characteristics in all possible worlds. Okay? So, therefore, there is at least one logically possible world in which a maximally great being exists. But, as I said, to be maximally great, a being must by definition, exist in all logically possible world. This world is a possible world, not only possible, but it is the actual world. And consequently, by definition, a maximally great being, that is God, that is an omniscient, omnipotent, and morally perfect being, a necessary being, also exists in this world. It's a strange argument. Now, there is a good and a bad. The good is that, according to Planega, existence is not a property. So, uh, unlike Anselm and Descartes, Planega cannot be criticized for saying that a God that exists is better because existence is a property like the sugar in the coffee that makes the coffee better. Uh, so existence doesn't make God better. That's not the argument. Plantinga says it is possible that a maximally great being exists. What is that? A being that has all the excellences Okay, all the attributes, all the excellent attributes uh, who exist, exists in all possible worlds, not only in one world. Um, so, Planiga claims that there is a serious logical possibility that God exists in at least one possible world, and if it does, then by definition... It exists in all possible worlds. And since we are in a possible world, which is actual, then God exists in this world, and therefore God is actual. Now, the bed. The bed is that the argument, and Plantinga knows uh, about this, that's why he's seems not to be very adamant about it. 
is that, as I said earlier, this very argument relies on a system of modal logic known as S5. There are different systems. S5, okay? S5, according to Plantinga, supports premise four. Premise four, I want to remind you, is that if a maximally great being exists, in one logically possible world, it exists in every logically possible world. Um, and so because our world is possible, then God exists in a possible world. And since our world also happens to be the actual world, then it follows that, that God is exists exist in this world. Many people, however, point out that the S5 system of modal logic relies on an axiom that is kind of suspicious. In other words, why should we take it for granted? Sure, it is an axiom, but why should we take an axiom for granted? especially when the stakes is so high, and namely, we are trying to prove the existence of God. This axiom is the following. S5 says that if A is possible, A will be an entity, will be anything. If something is possible, then it is necessarily true that that thing is possible. Okay? And that's the problem with, uh, with the uh, modal version of the ontological argument. Now, let's go back to uh, what I mentioned uh, earlier. I'm going to just mention one example. But as I said many times in the next lecture, I will uh, discuss other ways in which one might possibly show that the existence of God is impossible. Um, one, uh, one of the, uh, the most famous ways is the traditional argument from evil. I have a lecture dedicated to uh, the problem of evil. So I'm not going to make this uh, very long. What is the problem of evil? The problem of evil is that there is evil in the world. But how could you possibly have evil in the world, not any world, but our world and claim that God exists. If God is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good, infinitely good, infinitely loving, why is there evil in the world? Think about it, if you are a parent and you had all the powers in the world, would you not want to eliminate evil for your, for your children? Or would you want your children to experience evil, disappointment, pain, suffering? So that's the idea. So if there is dysteleological evil, dysteleological is the, the opposite of teleological. Teleological means that there is a purpose to something. So if there is pointless, purposeless, meaningless pain and suffering in the world, then the existence of a perfect being is impossible. Why? Because a perfect being, okay, an omnipotent being, has the power to destroy evil. And an omniscient being has the knowledge of how to do it. And an omnibenevolent being uh, would want to 
destroy evil for the same reason as uh, the uh, my analogy to uh, the parent. Now, it is a fact that there is pointless, purposeless, or, uh, or meaningless pain and suffering. Therefore, the existence of a perfect being of God is impossible. Well, the, uh, the question here is, can it be shown, can it be known whether premise two is true? In other words, how can we prove, how can we demonstrate that the evil in the world, I'm not saying that there is no evil in the world. I agree. It's a plain fact. People suffer, people die. There is a, there's a lot of evil. But can we say that that evil is pointless, purposeless, meaningless? Well, in recent years, many philosophers have demonstrated with uh, interesting arguments that um, the existence of evil is not useless or pointless or meaningless. At the very least, some evil is necessary because without evil we wouldn't be able to, uh, uh, to develop positive, uh, virtuous characteristics. And, uh, and a second point is that um, evil, at any rate, is not God's fault. So why should God eliminate evil? You say, well, because God is a uh, loving parent. Sure, but what does God have to do to eliminate evil? For example, would you say that a crazy person shooting uh, at children in a school and killing these children is an evil? Certainly, that's an evil. Now, how can God eliminate or prevent that evil? God would have to stop the bullets or modify the brain of the, uh, the crazy person in such a way that he or she will not decide to shoot and kill the kids. Now you can say that this is easy for God. God can do that. Probably God can, could do that. But then the argument would be that then God would have to program, would have to determine that person not to shoot or would have to uh, change the events um, of that person. Now you can say, well, why doesn't he just change the events? He's not limiting the person, he's just changing the events, the outcomes. Well, but the outcomes are the free events, the free outcomes, uh, the free actions of this person. And uh, in order for a person to be morally uh, praised or blamed, that person needs to uh, carry out his or her deeds. And if God prevents the bullet from killing the, uh, the kids, even though God does not modify uh, the, uh, uh, so determines that person, the shooter, well, he, he, God modifies the outcome of the free actions of that shooter. And consequently, he would undermine the, uh, the shooter's moral responsibility. But this is uh, a complicated question that we will discuss in, uh, in the uh, lecture, uh, lecture on, uh, on the problem of evil. So the bottom line is that... Um, it is not so clear that the evil in the world is purposeless, pointless, and meaningless. It's not completely clear. So what's the verdict? Well, 
does the ontological argument prove that God exists? Any version of the ontological argument? Well, this is for you to decide. You will let me know. You will let me know what, the, uh, what do you think about the, uh, the various ontological arguments. As a matter of fact, some people think that Kant's criticisms of the ontological argument, the traditional ontological argument, not the modal one, don't actually um, uh, affect the argument. They miss the mark. For example, some people say, remember that Kant says, existence is not a property. So you can't say that. When you add existence to, uh, to God, you make God better. Okay? Because if you, uh, if you think of God, you think of existence in, uh, in the first place, and that is the very thing that you have to prove. Now, some people say, well, actually existence does make something better. What if you think of Santa Claus? Which is better? A Santa Claus that exists only in your uh, mind or a Santa Claus that exists in the mind and in the North Pole and brings gifts, gifts on Christmas? Well, as I promised, this was a very controversial argument. We might never get to the end of this argument. But, again, this is up to you to decide. And until then, this is all, and I'll see you in the next lecture.